Development Center downstairs on the first floor in Yoshida. Um, we're really, really proud and pleased to once again present Ravi to you. He has given um, presentations on the, on the campus here for many years and is a, a big friend of, of college. He has been a, uh, a guest speaker at NAM several years over and has been a uh, performer on Letterman and Leno and Saturday Night Live. So would you please welcome Robbie. So how's everybody doing? Good. 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 Well, guys, we're here to talk about money. How's everybody doing? Really shit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> really shit. Dirt broke. Huh? <laughs> well, that's what we're kind of here to talk about. Endorsement, sponsorship, how as a independent artist, can you float a career um, maybe through B2B relationships, business to business relationships, sponsorship, endorsement deals. So uh, we're gonna talk a lot about that and sort of the how, how I've built this in my career. I spend right now this year 250 days on the road. Um, and I would say that that is 75% of that is supported by these companies behind me and a few others as well that we'll talk about. And that's really been my business model. You know, it started, it started like on a, I don't know, on a rainy day, it sounds good to say that. It started on a rainy day many years ago where I was probably playing a bar and nobody was going to show up and I was getting paid the door. And I was thinking, actually, yeah, and I remember there was like a hurricane warning or something. I was thinking, how can my life depend on the weather? You know, this isn't, this isn't a good deal. There's got to be a better way to guarantee how much money I'm going to make rather than depending on people to walk through the door. And that's where I started really trying to think outside of the box and start thinking about different things. Now, I'll tell you uh, right off the bat what I'm going to talk about and what I'm going to showcase this evening. It's not easy. It's work. It's hard work. But that's what makes it worth it. That's what makes it really cool. And that's what makes it successful. Because if you're willing to work on your own career and build your career into a viable business, man, you own your time. You own your life. You own your happiness. And you're not answering to anybody. Those 250 days a year that I travel, I choose where I want to go. I choose when I want to go. My wife decides when she wants to come with me. We decide how many days we're going to take off in the cool places that we go. And, while somebody else is paying you to be there. And to me, that's the ultimate situation. Yours may be different, and that's cool too. But this is an opportunity, tonight's an opportunity for me to showcase a little bit of the entrepreneurship angle and how to develop those relationships with other companies in order to do that. And, um, you know, as I said, it's work. It's not easy. But, as Confucius says, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And, that's a very important statement, I think, because I don't mind working. I don't feel like I'm a workaholic. My wife might tell you differently, but I don't feel like I'm a workaholic because I love what I'm doing. I'm working on my career. And in order to do that, a lot of that means following your dream, pursuing your dream. And my dream was to be Angus Young of ACDC. <laughs> Why are you laughing at my dream? Come on, guys. That's my dream. The ancient of ACDC, the power of rock and roll. I mean, that's what really excited me. Highway to hell. You know, it's just uh, it's what I wanted to do. It's what I wanted to pursue. And I begged my parents to give me an instrument. So on my 11th birthday, they bought me a guitar. And I, I was ready to go. I thought I was Angus. You know, I was dreaming. I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. So, you know, I see a, my dream was to play Madison Square Garden. And along the, along the years, I got to see a lot of my favorite artists, you know, perform, and my guitar heroes all perform in Madison Square Garden. So that was really a destination point for me. But it all started, you know, with that cheap guitar that my parents bought me on my 11th birthday. And I started my first band a few years later. You know, we thought we were pretty badass. All, you know, playing a lot of metal and things like that. Um, I love how, you know, we all got the fists going in that picture. You know, we're junior high school, 13 years old. But we also, 
I also kind of had a business mentality. My guitar teacher inspired that in me. And I started, you know, whenever we play, like at the local YMCA, I'd send out a press release to the local newspaper and just do stuff like that. And I, they actually started printing it. And it started to create this aura of, of professionalism, even at that young age. And I remember, like, being in school, we were, the, the teacher in middle school said, hey, you guys want to play field day? You know, something like that. I said, yeah, that'd be great. He said, okay, you can play. Get him up with a one-page contract. <laughs> He's like, come on, 13-year-old kid, one-page contract to play field day at middle school? But professionalism is the key. That's the thing. And if it becomes part of your philosophy, and part of the way that you work to be a professional, you'll be amazed how much you can garner, how much interest you can get from people that want to support you. So as things moved on, I started teaching at my local music store, started a local band, played a lot of clar uh, clubs and bars around um, New York City and New Jersey, Connecticut, that whole area. And also decided uh, that instead of spending a lot of money going into somebody else's studio, I decided I'd save the money and try and build my own studio and learn how to be an engineer. And you know, it was convenient because at the same time, I happened to be dating a girl in high school whose father happened to be a record producer. It's really, this wasn't as calculated as it sounds. <laughs> but after school, he would take me into the studio of New York City. In those days, the, the big studios that don't exist anymore, they're all closed, but the phenomenal rooms where amazing talent was working. And that's really where I learned what professionalism was when I saw the best of the best in New York City, working on jingles, working on just going in there and do what they do, being the best they can be. And it was so quickly then where I really realized another type of philosophy in life really is that you don't chase success. You pursue excellence and success will chase you. Maybe it sounds cliche, but it's just so true. You just gotta be awesome. How hard that can that be, right? And what that means is just constantly doing your best. You know, I was thinking about this quote, I've used this quote for a long time, but I was just yesterday thinking about it again, and it hit me in a different way. The most important word in that quote is pursue. You don't actually have to achieve excellence, you don't actually have to achieve the best, but if you're constantly pursuing excellence, you're becoming your best. And when you do that, it develops um, an aura about yourself, a professionalism about yourself, that makes people want to work with you. And that's really what we're talking about, ultimately, is why do people want to partner with you and why do they want to work with you? So I built this recording studio. It was the first ADAT studio. Anybody knows what, you know what an ADAT is here? Audio, right? Yeah, I'm feeling so old now. ADATs were the first multi-track digital audio tape that came out before Pro Tools and after the two-inch studios. And it was on like VHS. Anybody know what VHS is? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> VHS tape. And we record on VHS tape. So this was like state of the art, and I bought a couple of those with my teaching income and put them in my studio. I had the first ADAT studio outside of New York City, so I started to attract a lot of songwriters to my studio and really worked on that, <clears throat> trying to make excellent recordings and do things as well as I can. And there's a, there's a good story about leads to the next thing, which if there's time at the end, I'll go back and tell you remind me if you're interested, but I got a lucky break. And you know the phrase, luck is a moment when preparation meets opportunity. I think it's really, really true. Um, if you're not really prepared, if you don't really know what you want in life, you often don't recognize the opportunities that are around you. And there are opportunities around us all the time. But unless you're prepared, you just don't recognize them, so you can't capitalize on them. I think that's something that you'll see as we progress uh, through this presentation, that you know, all of a sudden, the better you become at this, the more opportunities you can recognize and capitalize on. And this was really the opportunity to join an unknown band. And the story's good, I'll tell you later if we have time, but essentially it was an unknown band, um, and I was referred to them. And the only thing that was interesting about it was that it was on Mercury Records, a major label. I had never worked with a major label. And so while there were so many reasons that I could have turned it down, I decided uh, to say yes instead. And it turned out to be the top-selling band in the world in 1997. Yeah, some of you were born then, right? 1997. Anybody know the top-selling band in the world? I, 
1997? Yeah. I ask this question a lot, and people sometimes say things like, Spice Girls? No, I wasn't a Spice Girl. <laughs> Three young kids from Tulsa, Oklahoma, called Anson. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, I like these pictures. I joined the I joined the band. The band really didn't launch until April, but I came on uh, just ahead of that. Um, Mercury Records had hired me to come on uh, as part of the launch. And you can tell this is early in our career. This is March of 1997. It's early because we're all flying economy class. But late in our career, August of 1997, you see we have a private jet and uh, a tour bus 15 million records later. A lot happened in those six months. And it was a pretty awesome experience. And got to do everything I ever imagined in this business. Played all the major television shows. We did Letterman a couple times. We did Jay Leno. A couple times, Rosie O'Donnell show, Saturday Night Live with uh, Jack Nicholson was the host. Weird experience, Jack Nicholson was the host. But it was awesome. We got to do everything I, I ever dreamed of, including playing Madison Square Garden on a double bill with Aerosmith because Steven Tyler was a Hanson fan and he was like, the cameras are rolling, but I'll say it anyway, he's like a giggling schoolgirl in our dressing room. <laughs> It was bizarre. It was surreal. The whole thing was surreal. And we ended the year playing Bill Clinton's Christmas party at the White House. <laughs> so it was a, an amazing experience, an unbelievable education. And you know, my brother, I, I come from a Wall Street family. My father and two older brothers from Wall Street and investment bankers. And I remember my brother sort of analyzing my whole career with Hanson. He said, that's kind of like going to the Harvard Business School, isn't it? It is. It's like the Harvard Business School of rock and roll. You get to do everything and learn everything that I possibly could about the industry, hanging out with people like Danny Goldberg, who discovered Nirvana, was this, who was the president of uh, Mercury Records at that time. So pretty, pretty awesome opportunity. Now, one of the things that, that I thought of, you know, I was being approached a lot by different people by magazines that were interested in the, the real story behind Hanson and stuff like that. And uh, one of the magazines, Musician Magazine, said, well, would you be interested in writing a story for us? Have you ever written before? And of course I said yes. But I'd never written a magazine. I mean, I'd written like an email. You know? <laughs> it wasn't lines. But I hadn't, I hadn't written uh, an article. My brother at the time was writing for Forbes magazine on investment banking stuff. But I figured I could go to him for some advice. So I wrote an article for Musician Magazine from the road about how I got the gig with Hanson as an educational tool to other artists about how to score a big time gig. Well, the other thing was because I was writing this article, I also started keeping a journal on the road of documenting kind of like what every day is touring with the top selling band in the world. I figured how many people actually get to do this, I want to write it down. I was very glad I did that because Simon and Schuster published it a year later. And I got to become an author and go out and do a book tour. And this was really cool because Simon Schuster was going to pay for me to go to all these, you know, stores like some mass market stores like I would do a, a signing in a Walmart for example, or Myers, but also a lot of Borders books, which no longer exist either, but you remember them, right, Borders books? And what was the full name of that store? You remember? Uh, Borders Books and Music. Borders Books and Music, exactly. So, so much of my itinerary was through Borders Books and Music that I thought, damn, i got to release an independent CD at the same time. So that's what I did. So I quickly went into the studio, grabbed some great players, including uh, Will Lee from New York, and I had him come. He and I wrote a song together and put it on the, the CD, and he played bass on some of the tracks. And I just pulled down this this the CD quickly in order to launch it the same day as the book was going to launch. And what happened was we ended up, and I said we because I hired a partner to handle this part of it. We ended up getting a distribution deal, national distribution deal, just based on the fact that I had a book to it. It's an interesting thing. In retrospect, what I do it again, no, uh, that's the seminar I'm giving tomorrow morning. 
But if we have time at the end, I can tell you the distribution story as well, because it really is a good lesson, but there's a lot to cover, and I don't want to run out of time. But anyway, so that was a real opportunity in order to start promoting my music. And what was kind of cool about it is I'd go to these border books of music, and I'd also play. And, you know, because it was handsome, there'd be like all these screaming 13-year-old girls in a border books of music. I mean, it was a zoo. It was crazy. At some point, I just couldn't believe that any of these people were coming, you know, for me. I figured there was, there was got to be something else going on. But there was a, tons of girls flooding these boarded books of music, and I'd go there with a the guitar, and I'd play. And, so that was good for me. It was good for the bookseller, for the vendor, the boarded books of music, because they were selling two products now instead of just one of these signs. And it was good for the publisher, Simon Schuster, because it became a very interesting, unique kind of book to it. So that was, that was different. This whole experience of kind of the things I'm talking about now led me onto the speaking circuit as well, because people like Berkeley and, and uh, NAM and other organizations, many of the music conferences, Atlantis, and, uh, Nemo used to be the one here in Boston, would ask me to come and speak about some of the experiences. Because what also happened, you have to remember, in 1999, the entire record industry imploded. And it was very interesting because I was there in the middle of that while all the record industry, all the record companies were crumbling around us, which is ultimately what ended up happening with Hanson. And um, Hanson kind of fell off the map, even though that still exists, fell off the map for a while due to that record industry implosion. But it was this solo experience, the combination of my book, the combination of my book and the CD, and then finally the speaking component, that all of a sudden started to build enough value where I could start to leverage some of the things that I was interested in. And the two most interesting things to me were Martin Guitars and Sennheiser. These were the, the products that I liked the most, the companies that had the type of uh, reputations, brands, that I wanted to be affiliated with. They were leaders in their industry, and I wanted to be affiliated with them. Always wanted to play Martin. Um, always wanted to use Sennheiser Wireless stuff. And I'll tell you the, the two stories that go with these companies, because this is a, kind of a, the lesson in, in how to present and how to pitch something. Um, thinking about my story, now you've got to remember, we're playing to young audiences, we were playing to young audiences. It's handsome. It's no longer handsome, the record company didn't exist. So I was doing this as an independent, but I still had a following of young people and maintained that following through releasing my own CDs and having the book. So I call up M Martin, and at this point, uh, Taylor guitars were really getting that singer-songwriter. All the singer-songwriters, all the electric band guys that were starting to do singer-songwriter stuff were buying Taylor guitars. Everybody was looking at Martin like, you know, <clears throat> I don't know, that's my father's guitar. You know, it's an old, it's an old person's guitar of Martin. So I called up the guys at Martin, and, and I said, you know, I don't forget this. The, I said, you know, I, I think you're really missing a big part of the market because people think of Martin as an old, you know, an old person's guitar. They would never thought about this. They'd, it never occurred to them. And I, I remember so distinctly, I think it was Chris Martin who said, said to me, you know, kind of with his ego, but he's very entitled to it, saying, because who am I? He said, like, you think we have a problem? And I turned to him and I said, no, I don't think you have a problem, but I think you have a huge opportunity. And Taylor's got that opportunity right now. They're taking advantage of it. So here's my suggestion. I'm going to all these stores and I'm doing all these, these book signings and stuff like that. Why don't I go play, you know, a Martin guitar instead in front of these young people? And they were sort of interested about it, and, and, and I said, you know, let's just try it, and we'll do it. It's, it's getting to a, an audience that you're not getting, a, a market that you're not getting. So they agreed to it, um, built me a beautiful guitar. Actually, it took a while to get it because it was still a treat when we picked out the wood, and it was a very cool experience in the Martin factory. The Sennheiser story was interesting because I was pretty arrogant at that point because I had a good relationship with Shore, their competitor. And Shore really wanted to work, you know, had worked with Hanson, wanted to work with me, but I didn't like the Shore product. I liked the Shore people, but I didn't like the Shore product. So I called up Sennheiser and I told them, I said, you know, Shore is really willing to give me anything that, that I want, but I like the Sennheiser product, and this is why, and I think, uh, I think you should give me some. 
I probably said it a little nicer than that, but that was the point. And they said, Sam Eisner said, uh, no, you know, we're, we're really not interested. You don't meet our criteria as an artist. And, you know, thanks for checking, but no thanks. And I was like, you know, my ego was totally bruised. And I was like, wow, that's, that's no good. But, but I said, well, why is that? Why aren't I meeting your audience? And they said, well, we really don't think there'll be the conversion. We really don't think that the people that you're playing to are ultimately going to gonna convert. So I decided after that conversation I wanted the Sennheiser product anyway. I wanted the Sennheiser wireless system. So I went out and I bought it. Paid full price for it, bought it. And I started doing more lectures and I started telling people about why I like the Sennheiser product over the Shore product. And then I decided I'm going to call Sennheiser back and I'm going to tell them I went out and I bought it. And I'm going to tell them that I'm actually going out and talking about it. And that they don't have to do anything. They don't have to pay me. They don't have to do anything. But, but give me more product information so I can be a better ambassador to that. And so I called the same person back and they said, oh, well, you're out there speaking to musicians at, at conferences and things? I said, yeah. And would you also be performing? I said, yeah, and I'll use it. But more than use it, I'll talk about it. You know, I don't have to rely on people to see it. I'll, I'll talk about it. So they said, OK, let's do something. So you know, they gave me the product that I wanted. Um, and that has, as you'll see, turned into an amazing relationship. Um, partly, I wouldn't say because I didn't accept no for an answer. I did accept no for an answer. But I also asked why. And I went back and I solved that problem that created value for them that they saw. And because of doing that, it's, it's uh, developed into a really good relationship. So I'm happy to, to accept no for an answer, but I'm always going to check why, and then I'm going to go back and double check to see if I can solve that problem and get a yes. In this case, I got a yes from Sennheiser, and it worked out to be really good. Now, the thing was, I had to try and create more value if I wanted these relationships to really last, because there's nothing worse than getting involved in a relationship where you're not really delivering enough. You know, it's not about what you get. It's about what you get. This isn't like marriage counseling, even though it sounds like it. But <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. It really is about, you know, what you, what you get. So I started trying to think, well, how can I offer more value to Sennheiser and Martin? Well, I've got some writing skills. I am a published author. So I started working and, and approaching other magazine companies to say, hey, can I write some more articles for you? And some of the magazines that I approached were actually trade magazines, magazines that are read by music dealers. Who's, who's the customer of Martin Guitars? You are? But give me a profile of the customer. Who buys Martin Guitars? People with country guitars. Country guitars? People who get the girls. People who get the girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just ask my wife. <laughs> this is an important thing to realize. The people that buy guitars from the Martin Company are the dealers that sell the guitar that sell the guitars to the end users. The players are not the customers and the manufacturers. The dealers are. And so I position myself in between the dealer and the manufacturer by writing for trade magazines. And I started writing articles about, you know, when, when uh, guitars started going to Walmart and stuff. And I was like, man, how do you sell a guitar at Walmart? Or in Best Buy. Yeah, I got great stories on that too, of my research. But you know, guitars should be bought in small, independent music stores, like mine was. And while my career was nurtured, and I got to live my dream because of that. So I, anyway, that was kind of my, my deal, and I would write a monthly column in some of those magazines. Well, all right, a company called Samic. Anybody hear of Samic? The largest guitar manufacturer in the world, Korean company. They make many of the Epiphones, and many of the Fenders, many of the other companies under other brands. But they decided they were wanted to launch their own brand called the Greg Bennett Design Guitar. Greg Bennett is a former vice president of Guitar Center, and he has a, a wonderful <coughs> eye for instruments. Partnered with Samick, and they said, look, we're only going to sell through small music stores. And they were reading my articles, and they said, you know, this guy is in our corner because he's defending our dealers. So how can we get into business with him? So they actually just called me. They got my number from my editor. 
and called me, and they first thing they asked me was, you know, would you like to endorse Sam at Guitars? And I'm kind of looking at my Martins, and I'm looking at the others in the studio going, Sam, isn't that kind of a cheap guitar? I, I'm trying to identify with brands that are really high quality. I don't think I want to do a deal with Sam. So I told them no. And they said, they said some very important magical words. They said, well, can we at least send you a few free guitars to check out? <laughs> I think we could probably manage that one. So they actually sent me a couple of guitars, and I thought they were nice. I figured, you know, maybe they would sell for thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars. I didn't think they were four or five thousand dollar guitars, but they, you know, maybe a thousand. I asked them, uh, you know, I called them back, say I'm not interested. I said, but what does that that Concord sell for? Guitar is called Concord. He said that one. It's three ninety nine. 399 for a guitar that plays like this. This is after my research of what was being sold in Walmart and, and other places for not much less money. And I was like, yeah, okay, we got to go out and tell the world about this because every young kid should be playing a Greg Bennett, not a piece of crap from a mass market retail. That's important for fostering growth, for the future of the guitar industry, for, you know, I'm like uh, idealistic and on my soap. So they said, well, would you be interested in doing clinics for us and going out and telling our stories? I thought, well, that was interesting. Okay, yeah. So I developed a clinic called Instant Guitarification. And a guitar clinic could be something as simple as, as a musician going out and just performing some songs. And, you know, you see a lot of guys that are no longer on the road that, that go out and do that and try and sell as many CDs as they can. But I wanted to go out and sell guitars. I was passionate <coughs> about these guitars for beginners. And so I developed... In fact, I thought I could play them myself, not just beginners. I thought they were good enough quality for a professional to play. And I said, and they're cheap enough to buy three or four for a professional. So this is real value for, for the guitar player. I've got to go tell people about it. So I, I developed this um, <coughs> clinic that was actually kind of a recording clinic because, it, because I could loop an acoustic, and then I could loop an electric, and then I could take a bass and loop a bass. And I could show the value of owning multiple instruments that everybody could afford with the Greg Bennett design. So they were on board, of course, and so Greg Bennett uh, and Sam and Guitars were there. But I realized while I was doing this, I'm also using a Digitech looper, I'm using a custom amplifier, I'm using this guitar strap, and you know, I don't like the pickups in this guitar, but the guitar's made so well, so a pro could just up, upgrade the, the pickups. So I called all these companies and did endorsement deals with Digitech, with Custom, with Seymour Duncan, with Levy's Leather Straps, because now they were getting promotion in their dealers, and Samick was paying for it. And all they were doing for me was giving me free gear and occasionally subsidizing maybe a particular dealer that they thought was important for them, and maybe they would throw in a little extra cash, and it would make for a better thing for me. So, this is how then now I've gone from two endorsement deals to basically seven endorsement deals at this point. Just by the nature of seeing that opportunity, by looking at what I'm using, figuring out that there's an audience there, realizing that I'm in a dealer where they're being sold, that this is creating a lot of value for these companies. So, you know, that's how that worked out. Now, I've become this guitar expert for, you know, whatever reason, but because I'm going out and doing these clinics, uh, people start thinking that, you know, you're calling me a guitar expert. And, and I would, um, you know, some of the things that we did with clinics, for example, is we'd charge $5 to, uh, to get into the clinic, but if you bring a canned food, then it's free. So now all of a sudden we're doing stuff in the community, and that started to generate a lot of press. The Fox Morning Shows wanted to have me on. The, um, so there's more exposure. And I'll give you an interesting, um, interesting example of, of how you generate media. Okay? I mean, the first thing you have to do is pick, pitch and attract the media. For media, it really has to have a community angle. Unless you're a huge star, you've got to find a community angle that services the angle. So that's where the, the whole canned food type of thing really, really worked out well. Um, and then you've got to leverage that media into something. You know, most of us think, all right, we book a show, now we've got to go out and promote it. I kind of think the opposite. I think, I've got to get some media, and then I'll book a show. 
that can benefit for, I'll book a bigger show than I was going to play because I've got the media or some, or some kind of event. And I'll backpedal on that so you, so you can understand that better. I'll acquire, um, acquire the data. I need to know how many people are watching the show in order to leverage the media. So acquiring like the viewership of a Fox morning show, for example, and then um, beating the average from a marketing standpoint. So let me back up and explain this. Okay, pitch, attract the media. Hey, I'm coming to your to your market to to speak. Actually, is what I was doing in this particular example to speak. And we're going to do a canned food drive, and I think it's something that we would like to bring people to because we're going to donate it to a local food bank. So they say, okay, yeah, we'd be willing to to come. Fox uh, Atlanta. Uh, said, okay, we'd be willing to cover you and, and have you on the morning show. And I said, great. Well, how many people watch the morning show? And they said, well, our viewership is 400,000 each morning. And I said, wow, that's a lot of people. I'll never get 400,000 to a show. I won't get 400 to a show. But what can I do with that 400,000? Well, one of the things I did, and, and this was like uh, maybe a week, a week before the, the television appeared. I called up Samick and I said, we got we to gotta book a, a clinic quick. I said, where? I said, we've got to book a clinic right outside of uh, Atlanta. And they said, when? And I said, next week. And I said, no way. We need 90 days to promote it. I said, nobody's going to come to the clinic. Well, why are we booking a clinic? And I said, because then it gives me something to talk about on the air. And they said, well, why is it? I'm sorry, we're not getting this. I said, all right. Here's the way I figure it. There's 400,000 people that watch that show every morning, okay? 400,000. Let's say 10% see my segment. So 40,000 people see my segment. Let's say 10% think about buying, going into the store to buy a guitar. Okay, so now we're down to 4,000 people think about it. Let's say 10% actually go into the store. So now we're down to 400 people. I say, let's say that only 10% of them actually buy. Now we're down to 40 guitars. Dwindle down from 400,000 to 40. It's like the worst case scenario. I said, then what's your profit margin on a guitar? They said, about 100 bucks. I said, well, well, I mean, you're guaranteed to sell 40 guitars. So that's $4,000 in a worst case scenario. And I'm charging you $1,000 for the clinic. Where else are you going to get a 400% return on your investment? It's like silence on the other end. <laughs> and the guy's like, all right, we'll book the clinic. <laughs> and I went and I did the clinic, and, and actually probably 50 people showed up. But um, it was just about leveraging media and creating value for the guitar company. And that's part of it, too. When you really do the, their homework, when you figure out something that's going to make him look good to his boss, and you let him take all the credit for it, you get a lot done. Doing your homework, crunching those numbers, results in a lot of cool opportunities. So, having done all this, then this this grew into uh, the guitar company Truefire. Noticed that I was this again guitar expert. I really put that in quotes, but that's what the media is saying. That's what all the press is saying. So, people, you know, if they say it, it's got to be true, right? So, um, so this company Truefire is the largest online. Uh, instructional video company that there is in the world calls me up and they say, you know, we'd be interested in maybe working with you. Our biggest problem is, is that we're trying to attract more people, more customers. So, well, you know, what customer segment are you missing? And they said, well, we, we don't have anything in the beginners market. That's the biggest opportunity, beginners. There are more non-guitar players in the world than there are guitar players. So let's go after them. So I created a beginner's course called Learn Guitar in 21 Days. And <coughs> The idea is, um, psychologists say it takes 21 days to change a habit. So I thought, this is cool. We can change the habit of not playing guitar to the habit of playing guitar. 20 minutes a day, 21 days, muscle memory, all of that. Play the finger the chords a little differently. And you realize if you can play, what, two chords, you can play a thousand songs, you can play four chords, you can play a hundred thousand songs, you know, whatever it is. And we have an online running list of how many songs you can play. And people all of a sudden realize, wow, after four days, you know, I can play thousands of songs. You know, whether they really can or not. Is, isn't the point. <laughs> the point is, <laughs> the point is they think they, no, the point is, is that um, it's, they're encouraged. The point is, is that they actually have the knowledge and the ability to do that, and they will keep working. 
or we can see something graph. So now I'm doing all these videos and I'm thinking, all right, I'm using pedals, I'm using amplifiers, and these are all going in videos of being sold to, you know, thousands of people. We actually, 21 Days, got a licensing deal on Home Shopping Network and, and with eMedia through Walmart and Kmart and all that stuff. So all of a sudden now that becomes real value in order to show more stuff. And, you know, I don't need to use a wireless system in this video, but why not? It's promoting a good product. And if I can do it and bring Sennheiser some extra value, then that makes it worthwhile. And that's when I really land the bulk of my endorsement deals. There are even a, a couple of like shove capos and some, some smaller ones that, uh, that aren't on here. But roughly a dozen companies that I work with closely. When I go to a NAM show, I always go to every NAM show and I go hang out in their booths and I promote their products and I go to them for interviews when I write a magazine, I try to get a quote from them. I do everything I can to constantly create value. I am not just getting up and using their equipment and saying, I've done my job. That's not, it's not enough. They even realize now that even if you're Clapton, that's not enough. They're not seeing the conversion in that kind of stuff anymore. And artist relation departments have cut down drastically on the amount of deals. They just get people that stand up on stage. So you've got to create more value constantly. And really, that's, that's the way that I try to create value. So with all of their support, I could now take my band out and go out and do a whole bunch of gigs with a lot of great gear. That's all it was. It was gear. I wasn't able to get them to give me money to go out and play gigs. So then I started thinking, well, why won't they do that? It's not really in their culture to do that. They're, they're guitar companies and stuff. They give away gear. They don't really pay people to, to play their stuff. So I thought, well, how can I leverage this into something else? So I was thinking about outside the music industry now. What are the other things that I use? And two companies came to mind. A mortgage company that I used when I moved to New Orleans, and Volkswagen. I drove a Passat at the time. So the first thing I was doing is I had a festival that I wanted to play in New Orleans. Um, I was living there at the time, so it wasn't a big deal. I just wanted to pay the band. Didn't make a lot of money, but wanted to make sure that everybody got paid. And what, one of the things is I went to New Orleans just to speak, fell in love with the city, and moved there. And this happens all the time, pre-Katrina days. This happened all the time. People would just go there to visit for Jazz Fest or, or something, and then they'd realize, wow, real estate's so cheap. I could buy a place here for less than I'm paying to rent it for the two weeks during Jazz Fest. So I actually had that same experience and went to the mortgage company who was helping me with my mortgage, and I said, would you guys be interested in me in sponsoring me to perform at the French Quarter Fest? Because you know who's attending. A whole bunch of people that are coming down for the weekend and falling in love with New Orleans. And if we can get that message out there that they shouldn't be paying that rent for the two weeks, but they should invest in some property, you could be there and convert it immediately. And they never really thought of that. They never really thought of a music festival. But it was something that was drawing people. So they, they did it. They sponsored me. I think it was maybe $2,000. And uh, everybody got paid well. And they were able to put out some of their literature. And I'd say, tell that story from the stage. I said, Hey, like, you know, like many of you, I came down here and just fell in love with the place. Man, I didn't realize that I could actually buy a place here. Uh, it's cheaper than the rent that you're paying. You know, people come up and ask me questions about that afterwards, and I'd introduce them to Bob and add a new mortgage, and it was just like, turned into a great, great relationship. The other one is while I was living in New Orleans, I wanted to play a festival in Connecticut, where I grew up, and uh, I wanted to take the band from New Orleans to Connecticut. So I thought, uh, I love my Passat. I'm going to call it Volkswagen America and see if, uh, if they, they'd be interested. So I called them up and I say, hey, you know, I drive a Passat before I drove a Jetta. You know, of course you're going to be interested. And they just basically laughed. Uh, you know, it's like, who, who are you again? Why would we give you any money to do that? I said, I'll park in my car by the stage. You know, it didn't make any sense to that. So that was a, that was a miss. So I thought about it. I said, yeah, what if I call up the dealer? where I bought my car, because that's up in Connecticut. And I'm going to be performing for their local, for their local uh, audience. So maybe that'll be of interest to them. Well, before I called them, I got a copy of the local newspaper, and I saw that they were, that dealership was running half-page ads in the local newspaper. So I called up the local newspaper and said, yeah, I'd like to buy a half-page ad. What does it cost? And they sent me their rate sheet. 
And I said, uh, okay, that's cool. What's your circulation? They said, well, about 60,000 people will read our paper. So I took that cost of that ad, I divided it by 60,000, and I instantly knew what Volkswagen dealership was paying for their advertising to reach 60,000 people on a per head basis. I don't remember the number now, but it was something like 60 cents per person or something like that. So I called up the festival I wanted to play and told them, you know, they had already told me that uh, they were, I, I think I wanted $2,000 and they said, ah, well, you know, all we can pay you is $500. 500 I can't remember that, $500. I said, I'll tell you what, what if you don't pay me anything? Like, what, you don't want to be paid anything? I said, no, but I want a free ad space in your program for the festival. Just give me a, a small quarter ad space for your program. I said, sure. I mean, you know, that didn't cost them anything. They had the space. And they were saving 500 bucks. So I said, great. How many people come to the festival? They said, 300,000. I knew a thousand, if I'd be lucky if a thousand people saw me perform. But I know 300,000 people are getting that program with that ad space. So I turned that around and I said, look, um, I know, I called the vote for the Volkswagen dealership. And I said, look, I know you're paying roughly 60 cents uh, per person. I don't think they knew that until they punched the numbers. And they said, oh, yeah, that's right. All right, we're paying 60 cents per person. And whatever, it is. that's not the right number. I don't remember what the right number was. But I figured out what, how many people were coming to see me. And if so, so a thousand people come see me, 300,000 people are getting that program. You know, I realized that I could get um, 10,000, close to $5,000, I think, if the, the number's right, from them in order to beat the price that they were already paying to advertise to that same group. Now, think about this. I was offered 500 to play. They said, Volkswagen said that they wouldn't support me. And now I can turn around to that dealer and make 10 times the amount of money and still give them a better return on their advertising costs than they're currently getting. The math works. When you just do the math and you do the homework for them, it just works. I didn't ask them for $5,000. I didn't need the $5,000. I probably asked them for $2,000 or $2,500. I made it really cheap for them um, in a worst case scenario. And I got more than the festival was going to ask me to do. So it really comes down to that kind of philosophy and that kind of willingness to do the homework and to do the math. And it's kind of fun. If you, if you can kind of get into it, kind of fun to sort of beat the system or game the system as it were and do something different and and try to um, try to inspire that. So you know you gotta identify the appropriate sponsor, something, someone, something that you're already using. In both these cases, I was already a customer of both of them. Just like Sennheiser, when Sennheiser said no, but then they said yes, they said yes because I was a customer at that point. I went out and I bought the stuff. It's very valuable to approach them as a customer, as a satisfied customer. I understood the sponsors' needs. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to advertise. I know uh, who they're trying to advertise to because I've done my homework. So I recognized my value of going there. So I knew what I needed to make. But what was most important is to quantify the opportunity value. I knew what I could, I determined what I could sell that value back to the sponsor for in a manner and at a price that was really valuable to them. And then trying to create added value in any way that I possibly can through my website, through various different things. And uh, putting that all together in a one-page marketing proposal, really important one page, two pages, people put two-page stuff on the side of their desk, they'll look at it later. One page, they glance over immediately and uh, automatically form their opinion. So, if, you know, my marketing proposals are just like one page of, of bullet points as to who, what, where, when, and why, basically, and why they should do it, and how the math makes sense. So, again, in philosophy and really trying to think big, I really like thinking big. I always think about this quote from Michelangelo, the real danger in life is not to aim too high and miss, but to aim too low and achieve. The real danger in life is not to aim too high and miss, but to aim too low and achieve. Michelangelo, really, you know, just all started with a big dream. Started with a big dream, and I just continued to focus on that. And even once I got to do some of those cool things that I did, I really continued to focus on how can it be bigger? How can it be 
more independent? How can it be more exciting? And how can I make a living? So that was a dream. I almost had another dream, though. I wanted to be a captain of a 747. And there were so many times where I was sitting in that recording studio, you know, with all the buttons and lights, imagining I was in a cockpit of 747 with all the buttons and lights. I don't know. I just thought it was cool. Aviation uh, was a big deal. And I was at, um, I was performing at a Sennheiser party. Because Sennheiser had become a big uh, sponsor of mine at the NAMM show in 2008, in January 2008. I was um, there, and the uh, CEO of Sennheiser, who was an avid reader of my columns, and one of the people that would comment to me a lot about my columns, and somebody I'd interviewed, comes up to me and he says, uh, hey, Robbie, I want to meet, I want to introduce you to Daniel Sennheiser. He's come from Germany. <coughs> wow, this is cool. I get to meet one of the people from, the, from Sennheiser. So I'm talking to Daniel Sennheiser, and about five minutes we're talking about music. For whatever reason, we start talking about airplanes. I wasn't a pilot. I just always thought airplanes were cool. Daniel's a pilot, owns a plane. And for 45 minutes, we're talking about airplanes. And he says to me at the end of the night, he says, you know, Rob, if, if, if you don't pursue this, you're just never going to be happy. You've got such a passion for aviation, you've got to do it. So I did. I went out in 2008, and I got my pilot's license. And I was really excited about it. And I started, you know, much like the, the journal that I kept during Hanson, I started taking pictures and, and putting them up on a website. And I couldn't figure out what to call the website. The Aviator was already taken by Howard Hughes. But I realized, damn, if I just put an R in the middle of it, I got the Robbie here. <laughs> and that became my brand in aviation, Robbieator.com. And I just had a ball learning to fly. Think like a man of action, act like a man of thought. A French philosopher. So here I am, now a pilot as well. What do pilots need? Pilots need a lot of stuff. One thing they need is a headset. So I started to look around for a headset. And one of the names that came up as a headset manufacturer was Sennheiser. I said, Sennheiser makes aviation headsets? I didn't know that. Nobody in the aviation industry ever said, why don't you try a Sennheiser? So I called up Sennheiser. And I said, you know, could we expand our endorsement deal from the professional audio into the aviation spectrum? They said, sure, we can do that. And the, um, the, my contact over there said, hey, we're actually, you, you want to come to Sun and Fun with us next week? I said, sure. What's Sun and Fun? I don't know. It sounded cool, right? Sound fun. <laughs> so it's, it turns out it's the second largest air show in the country. I said, why don't you come with us? You know, put your out, uh, you know, check check out what it's like. So I said, okay, well, that's cool. Um, and they knew me from the music division, so they said, you know, why don't we why don't we print something up and we'll do a signing at the booth. Okay, so I took a picture of myself with the headset, quickly in the plane, got her over to them, they printed up you know, all these things, and we thought we'd do a signing at the, at the booth at Sun and Fun. Well, now, from the music industry, I'm a speaker, I'm, I'm all these things. I started thinking uh, about how could I build on this. I got my ears covered. I just bought a set of really nice Maui Gym sunglasses. Um, just like the week before. I had never spent $300 on a pair of sunglasses before. I thought it was ludicrous, but my wife thought I looked really sexy in them, so I figured, <laughs> got to get the Maui Gyms. So I got the Maui Gyms, and I thought, well, nobody in the aviation industry seems to be wearing Maui Gyms, as far as I can tell. So I called up Maui Gym, and I said, you know, I'm going down to the second largest air show next, next week. And, uh, you know, uh, I, nobody seems to know about Maui Jim in the aviation industry. Would you be interested in maybe partnering on this and trying to let pilots know that these are the coolest glasses, you know, on the planet? And they said, well, yeah, we'd love to. We've never really thought about the aviation industry. Let's, why don't you pick out a handful of pairs that you like, we'll overnight them to you, you know, take them down to the show, and see what you can do. I said, okay, what am I going to do, though? How am I going to... 
tell people, I can't just, I'm not going to walk around the show as a student pilot and say, hey, by the way, check out these now. <laughs> so I called up the directors of the show, and I said, you know, I see you, you have speakers. I'm actually a speaker in the music industry. But what I don't see in your lineup is that there aren't any students talking. And the students are the customers of your industry. So I'd like to give a presentation on why there's a shrinking pilot population, which is a huge problem in our industry, in that industry. Shrinking pilot population. I'd like to tell you from a student perspective. So they actually gave me a spot to go speak. This is like, I had like three days to come up with a presentation. But now at least I had an opportunity to talk about Maui Gym to an audience, to talk about San Jose, and create value as part of my presentation as a student pilot about some of the issues in the industry. So that worked out really well. And in fact, because I had given that lecture, Sennheiser said, well, you know, maybe we should do more. And I said, I think we should, because nobody seems to know who Sennheiser is in the aviation industry. Everybody knows in the music industry who Sennheiser is, but nobody knows who Sennheiser is in aviation. They said, this is a problem. I said, well, I'd like to bring your music credibility into the aviation industry. So why don't you sponsor my presentations in aviation? talking about how to grow the pilot population. And they thought that was cool because I'd bring that, that music uh, angle of, of my credentials into aviation. But what was really interesting is that when I became a pilot, what I realized is that I was meeting more deaf pilots than I had ever met in rock and roll. Pilots are all hard of hearing. Sennheiser Aviation makes headsets. Headsets protect hearing. Let's add a saving your hearing component to all of the lectures and go out and explain to people why they need to protect their hearing and why the Sennheiser product is, and it actually is, the best one on the market for that purpose. And let's build your brand that way. As a result of that, they pay my mortgage now, pretty much. This has been one of the most successful conversions. Um, of any of any deal and a great relationship. Remember, they said no to me initially. They weren't interested, and we managed to build this into something. Well, what would I do? I started writing for for aviation magazines because that's what I knew how to do, right? I was writing for music magazines, so why not start writing for aviation magazines about similar topics, customer service, um, hearing protection, a lot of that as well. And so that was interesting, and and, and so I had these two endorsement deals. There was a huge problem, though. This was one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made was Maui Gym. I do love their sunglasses. Beautiful sunglasses. Anybody own Maui Gyms? Can't afford them. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't own them either. I had to pay for them. But they're awesome sunglasses. But there was a reason why nobody in the aviation industry had heard of them. Maui Gym only makes polarized sunglasses. A pilot cannot wear polarized sunglasses. It's a safety hazard. And not only that, for airline pilots, their windshields, because they fly with instruments, their windshields are all polarized anyway. A pilot needs to see glare of an, of an oncoming aircraft. Polarization wipes out glare. Great for golfers, great for surfers. Not so good for pilots. <laughs> Oops. Not only, was I promo not only was I promoting Maui Gym to an audience that can't use Maui Gym, but I was doing a disservice to everybody, every pilot I was telling, a safety disservice to every pilot I was saying, you got to go out and get Maui Gyms. Couldn't do it. So, had to uh, politely tell Maui Gym, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I just can't do this, it wouldn't be right, and we're going to have to part ways. And so we did, and I found another company called Vidalo HD, uh, who makes unbelievably great aviation glasses. And this has turned out to be another great relationship. So I got the eyes and ears covered. And because of all the different things that I'm doing, so other companies came on board, like Lightspeed Aviation Headsets. Big problem, two competing, endorse, two competing companies endorsing the same person. I've never done that in the music industry, never. Uh, that's a big taboo. You should never do it. It's not a good thing to do. I did it in this case for a very particular reason. The, the aviation industry is small. It's got a customer service problem. It doesn't get along with itself. And I went to these companies and I said, we got to set an example that competitors in aviation can get along. And I want to be that link. And they both agree. And they're both uh, big sponsors. But it, it's, a, it's a tricky situation often. 
And then a couple other companies, including Cessna Aircraft Manufacturer, are going to come in. And these are my aviation sponsors. So it's the same model applied to a different industry. So now I go out as a speaker a lot in aviation. It's one of the biggest, the biggest things I do. 50% of my road travel is aviation speaking now. Talking about growing the pilot population and saving your hearing. And, and really, I, I talk about ACDC and, and music industry and that's regarding the Hanson and all that kind of stuff because uh, the aviation industry seems fascinated by it. In fact, so fascinated that the same company, Sun and Fun, who had me speak at that first air show, they actually do a cruise every year. And they've hired me in the last three years to be their speaker, cruising around the crew. How cool is that? 100 pilots on a boat. Well, what could go wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. we, have, we just have so much fun. And my sponsors pay, pay me to do that because it's a very concentrated group of affluent people with money that are cruising around the Caribbean and all own airplanes. And we go out and we have a blast. But it was interesting. So my passions really, really have united here. And one of the things that's so fascinating about it is that what I realized in the aviation industry is I keep meeting musicians who are pilots. I mean, everywhere I go, every airport I go, I meet musician after musician. I said, this is so strange. I mean, you know, both of these industries attract passion-driven people. You know, there's something amazing. 49.7% of pilots play a musical instrument. Half of the pilot population, it's one of the largest crossovers. I stumbled into this. So my wheel starts spinning. All right. How can we make this work? 50% of the pilot population plays the musical instrument. All right, first thing I'm going to start doing is become the guy that performs at all the air shows. So I started focusing on that and playing at the air shows. I play Oshkosh, air, Oshkosh Wisconsin air show, 600,000 people. It's crazy. Sun and Fun, about 180,000 people. <laughs> and there's a real interest in music at all these shows. So I go out and perform. But this was the real interesting one. The Radiator Signature Guitar. A guitar designed specifically for pilots. <laughs> Why does this make any sense? Well, one of the things I realized meeting all these um, pilots who play music, right, 50% of them, is that they all had a problem traveling in their small planes with their guitars. They couldn't, and neither could I, couldn't fit the guitar in my small plane. So I partnered with the Voyager Guitar Company and said, let's do a signature model folding guitar for the aviation industry. It's awesome. I play these things now all the time. Acoustic and electric, I travel with them a lot of times. They're made. Even if I'm playing a show that has nothing to do with aviation, instead of just walking off and saying goodnight, I fold my guitar up before I leave. <laughs> guitar's not supposed to do that. Um, and, it, and it makes for a really interesting thing. So the pitch, the pitch to the guitar company. I said, we've got to do a signature model for the aviation company, for the aviation industry. And they said, why? That doesn't, you know, why is this of interest? So I said, okay. 50% of pilots play a musical instrument. There are 600,000 pilots in the United States. That means that 300,000 of them play a musical instrument. Statistically, 60% of musicians play guitar. That's 180,000 guitarists that can't fit their instrument into their airplanes. Okay. It's just math. It's just math. You can't deny the math. And they said, of course, well, we could do a signature model and, and and call it, you know, it's called a radiator, but that was actually the nature of the, of the um, logo, is we really wanted to, what to stand out as the aviator. So every aviator feels like this was made for them because they're arrogant people that want <laughs> well, we're pilots, right? So we, um, oh, they're wonderful people, really. But they want something that's made especially for them. So the aviator, radiator guitar. So I thought that was uh, a really good crossover. Oh, that's my new car, by the way. I don't have, um, I sold the, the Passat pretty recently and just bought this uh, a couple of months ago. Anybody know what it is? Civic. Yeah, Civic. it's a Honda Civic Si. And it's funny, I was looking for a new car and I went to the Toyota dealer because I wanted to buy a RAV4, right? RAV4, RAV, I figured this is good branding. I got on a RAV4. <laughs> oh, no. So I went and I tested it. <laughs> 
so I went and I test drove it, and I, I didn't like it. My wife didn't like it either. We both go out and said, that's a cool looking little red sports car there. Maybe we should just go buy that. And so I looked at it, and I, I took it for a test drive. I love it. It's fast. It's fun. And so we bought, bought the Honda Civic SI just because we loved it. You know what else Honda makes? Guitars. <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, I did get the Raviator license plate on it. Honda makes jets. Yeah. Yeah. They just launched their new, they're launching their new jet this year. I didn't even know that. It's been kind of secret. But when I started doing a little bit more research, I said, wait, they're getting into the jet market? Somebody's got to go out there and start talking about Honda jets. <laughs> what better than a Honda owner? <laughs> Along the same lines. So I started, so I approached Honda Jet. I had a meeting with them earlier this year about it. We're, we're still negotiating, talking about it. And so anyway, I got my Honda, I got my Honda Civic. I signed up online, you know, as a Civic owner and stuff. I get an email that says Honda's got a new program called Honda Stage, promoting concerts. I said, I just bought the car because I liked it. <laughs> but this is part of recognizing opportunity. It's all right there. The trifecta of what I do is all right there. And so now what we're doing, the angle with Honda Jet, because Honda Jet has nothing to do with the music side of Honda, that's only the Honda Civic side has to do with the music side, is to create a Honda Jet music tour. Why? Because 50% of cars play a musical instrument. So it makes sense. There's a, there's a strong music connection with that community. So it all makes sense. So we're, we're currently working this out, and now we're going to do it right now. So it's all very new, but this is in, in the process. Last year I got my own app. <laughs> iRobby app, mobile app. It's really cool. It's fun. I uh, developed it last year with the company. I, I partnered with the company. I do giveaways on there. There's artist resources, flight training services, scholarship information. In fact, the app has become so cool because my sponsors love it. And so all of you can go to iRobby.mobi and enter to win a Sennheiser. 935 mic microphone this month, so you should do it. Definitely enter. Got nothing to lose, right? And um, I do these promotions with my sponsors every month, and it's a really cool app. It's not just your regular app. It's got geofencing technology in it, which is like geolocation marketing stuff. It's, it's really complicated. It's taken me such a, a long time to to learn about it, but um, it's really fascinating what it does. So think about it. Go to irobby.mobi and uh, just go to giveaways and enter it. So the app is cool. I'll get back to that in a minute. Where do you go from here? You gotta think global. That's the that's the other angle. You know, there's a whole world out there. It's not just the United States. It's not just Massachusetts, it's not just the United States, it's not just North America. There's a whole freaking world out there of interesting things to do. And I started talking to my sponsors and, and thinking, well, what's going on? I live part time in Paris in France, so I thought well, what can we do over there? So I decided to convert the Raviator to uh, the Raviator. And I, oh I learned French with Alpha, my wife, she's French, and started giving my presentations in French in France. But what does this do? This opens up France, obviously, it opens up much of the Caribbean, opens up all of North, North Africa. All these French places like Vietnam, all are now places where I can create value for my sponsors. I wrote a, a magazine article on uh, hearing protection in French at uh, Sennheiser sponsor that article. And really expanding, because that's the thing, there's, there's, there is a world out there. And what really fascinates me is the BRIC countries. You know what the BRIC countries are? Brazil, Russia, India, China. This is, these are the emerging markets. This is what's really awesome and exciting. And this year, NAM invited me to come to Moscow to speak on mobile marketing, just because I got an app last year. And they said, you know, do you think you could do a presentation on mobile marketing? Of course, I said, of course I can, yeah. And then I worked really hard. 
to learn everything about geofencing technology and mobile marketing. And so they had me come to, to Russia and I performed there. This was two months ago. And it was really well received. So that was Russia. So then they said, hey, what are you doing next month? I said, I don't know, what? They said, will you join us in Shanghai and give the same presentation? And I said, sure, let's book a gig and perform. I'll come there and do it. They hired me to come to China last month. I just got back uh, last week. It was awesome. And I'm sitting there talking about you know, geofencing and e-market. It's really just stuff that I just learned. But I worked really hard to understand it well enough to be able to explain it. I'm giving the same presentation next week in Los Angeles, and then again in Anaheim in January, all on mobile marketing and geofencing. And I actually, this was really predominantly for NAM music retailers. So the one I'm giving next week is really for artists. How do guys like us, how do I use geofencing and mobile marketing technology to help and to, to create extra income for what I do? So that's the, that's the two of the four of them. Um, Russia and China, but uh, India is important. I'm half Indian, half Indian after. And be the change you wish to see in the world is an important thing to think about, an important quote, one that I always think about. And so a project that I joined in 2010 is a boarding school project for the poor in India. And it's pretty amazing. You know, we take these kids out of the villages at the age of four, and we pay for their education through their master's degree. And we've had the school now for 17 years. I just joined it more recently. I've partnered with it. And I go there and I perform for these kids. I teach them music. I teach them public speaking. I teach them aeronautical science. And do all sorts of cool things. And it's amazing. 17 years of school has gone on. These kids who are eating bugs, when we pull them out of the village, literally eating bugs, these kids are in the first cycle now, working at Goldman Sachs, the letting two, putting on suit ties every day, making money. It's pretty awesome. And it's probably the most, it, it, it's, it's where most of my energy and most of my thought on everything that I do funnels ultimately to these kids. Because I think it's really important that all of us are involved in something like that. And one thing I thought, I've been involved in, prior to this I did a, Music for enrichment, a music enrichment program for homeless kids when I lived in New Orleans. Prior to that, I did other stuff. It's never about giving back. People always say, yeah, you know, you give back. I'm not. It's all about paying it forward. All of us can be involved in this kind of stuff right now at some level because it actually grows with you. It supports your art. It supports your business. People are interested. People want to talk about it. Companies want to align themselves with you. It all works together. And it's a very important component. If I had to divide my career into sections, it's artist, aviator, activist. There, and all of us should have those kinds of uh, channels in order to create a lot of value. And this is something I'd just like to share um, with you. The last time I came back from India, I actually went to work with some foster kids in Los Angeles right after that. And I said to these kids, I said, hey, you guys want to talk to the kids in India at some point? Set up a Skype chat or something? They were like, yeah, I want to do that. And I asked the kids in India, and they were like, yeah, I want to do that. And I was like, oh, no. I don't know why this is going to work out. Are they going to mean to say to each other? So I scripted a 30-minute Skype chat. And it was absolutely amazing. Within 10 seconds, I mean, within 10 minutes, they were off my script. 90 minutes later, they were still talking. And they got to the point where they were just showing each other dance moves. And these kids in, in Los Angeles couldn't believe that some kid in the village of India is dancing like that. And the whole thing ended with the kids in India beatbox. In real time with the girls in Los Angeles dancing. And it was just amazing how well they bonded. And I did a press conference right after that. And you know, I said, can you imagine if we could get you know, young Palestinian kids to do this with young Jewish kids before we teach them all how to hate each other. It could be a pretty cool thing to be involved in. It's so important that this type of thing is part of our story in order to generate all sorts of things. Interest, money, funds, and bottom line, doing good. 
doing good for humanity is doing good for business. It's something I'm always talking about. So let's break this down. What is the actual deal with a sponsorship deal? Somebody define what an endorsement deal is or what a sponsorship deal is. Back scratching. Back scratching? Yeah. Interesting. Anybody else? Okay. Is an endorsement deal I have on right there? Yes. <laughs> Endorsed his back? I don't know. Sounds weird. They're monkeys. You know, you scratch their back and then they scratch your back. It's an advertising deal. That's all it is. As simple as it is, a sponsorship and endorsement deal is all about advertising. Creating value and advertising. Who is, uh, who's endorsed? So you get into a deal with, why well, I didn't mean you personally, but that's cool, congratulations. A little bit, not really, they call it an endorsement, but I still have to pay for stuff. So you, you pay discounted. So I pay discounted, discounted. does that count as an endorsement? Yes, really? yeah, yeah, absolutely, artist pricing, absolutely. That's an endorsement, that's a legal endorsement. Yeah, they're generally, you know, there's the customer price, there's the artist price, there's the A-level artist price, which is zero. Um, and then if you can even then create additional value and convert that into cash, very difficult to do, but hopefully I've proven that it's not impossible. Um, it, it can yield into something very successful. But I think in the relationship between artist and company, who's the endorser and who's the endorsee? Well, that's what I mean, it goes both ways. Like, I'm back, I'm back, Greg. Mm -hmm. It's like, they get something from you and you advertise their stuff. And you advertise their stuff. What you're really doing is you're endorsing their stuff. Yeah. And that's a key thing to remember. A lot of artists walk around and say, I'm endorsed by Sennheiser. I'm endorsed by Martin. No, I endorse Sennheiser. I endorse Martin. In exchange for that, they give me sponsorship. And I think it's a philosophical uh, understanding that's important. Because it means that I have to create value. I have a responsibility to these companies. And I also have a responsibility to all of you that I take very seriously by promoting Sennheiser and Martin as I have today, just by virtue of this presentation. It is a responsibility. I wouldn't be comfortable, I, I, my integrity would not be intact if I didn't sincerely believe that for me, they're the best in their category, and I believe they would be for many of you as well. So the artist is endorsing a product in exchange for sponsorship from the company. It is ultimately just an advertising deal. And when you're advertising, it means that you want to reach the most people the most often for the least amount of money. That goes back to all the math that I've talked about in all those situations. That's all I'm trying to achieve. How can I help this company reach the most people most often? That's part of the reason why I wanted to do monthly columns and magazines. That's the most often. That's good for me, too, because my name is being branded. Branding is so important. Um, like in the aviation industry, I mean, I don't even use Ravi. I just use the Ravi. I kind of feel like a like a action hero. People say, "Hey, it's the Ravi." I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of corny. But it's kind of funny. It works. It uh, it's a brand that really, really works. What are the sponsorship opportunities? Well, the charity events. Those are some of the obvious ones when you're playing charity. People like to be associated with a good cause. Um, so that's the type of event where you might want to uh, try to work with a sponsor. Festivals are a good one as well. Festivals, because festivals attract a lot of people. How can you um, get that sponsor in front of the most people you can? Remember, a festival that's attracting 300,000 people over the weekend is not going to see you perform those 300,000 people. You may get 1,000, you may get 300. It would be false to tell the company that you're going to expose them to 300,000 people unless you do a deal like the one that I described where I got them advertising space in the program where all 300,000 people were exposed to that company. So you've really got to think about your responsibility to the deal and make sure that you follow through and deliver. That's the key, by the way. My relationship with Sennheiser has gone on now for 12 years, with Martin for 12 years. Most of these companies, it's gone on for close to a decade. It wouldn't do that unless I constantly delivered. So you have to have that level of responsibility. No over-promising, no under-deliver. If anything, the opposite. Try to under-promise and over-deliver. Media exposure, if you have that opportunity to, to do that. And there are a lot of times where there are a lot of magazines that are looking for people to write. 
And whenever somebody says, no, we don't pay, you know, that irritates me to some degree, but I also know there's a huge opportunity in that. To the point where maybe I don't want them to pay because I'll leverage the exposure better. And it's ultimately, you know, the B2B opportunity is really big. When I lecture at NAM, it has nothing to do with fans, it has nothing to do with the public. It's all about helping the manufacturers reach their dealers. So I've sort of carved a little niche in that business to business relationship that they have. And, um, you know, that, that may, may or may not be something that you can do. That may, not everything is for everyone. And then the niche markets. And that's something I think all of us can do. All of us can find our niche. It's the most important thing. And, it, and the easiest way to do it is, you know, we're obviously we wouldn't all be in this room if we were not passionate about music. But chances are, as soon as we leave this room, we're also passionate about something else. It might have to be airplanes. If yours is cooking, if yours is whatever it is, when you're passionate about something else, and really passionate about it, you can find the intersection of those two passions. And I have now, you know, as I've described, you know, the 49.7% of pilots that play the musical instrument, I really thought I was pretty unique. Thought, who's sexier than me? A rock and roll guitar player flies airplanes. And now I realize there are quite a lot of us. So, <laughs> but that's good. <coughs> so I'm okay with that. But, you know, so those are the types of things that when you think about pursuing your passion, think about pursuing your passions and where they intersect. And that really can become your niche market. You can really own that. Any products, you know, think beyond the music industry. It's not just about getting here. Think, <coughs> think of what value you can provide outside. Um, Volkswagen was the example that I gave you before. Um, only choose products that you love and use. Duracell. I love Duracell batteries. Isn't that ridiculous? Duracell 9 volts. One of my favorite 9 volts. How many people can say they have a favorite 9 volt? I can say that. Why can I say that? My first Sennheiser wireless system used a 9 volt. And I mostly used Duracell 9 volts. But I put an Energizer 9 volt in there once. And it rattled. The connection wasn't as good. So I pulled it out. I compared the batteries. I got out a ruler and all this stuff. I realized the Energizer battery was slightly smaller than the Duracell. I said, man, every musician needs to know they got to use Duracell 9 volts in their in their wireless systems, otherwise they're risking losing a, a connection. And I called up Duracell and I said, hey, you want to do this? <laughs> I think that absolutely every um, everybody should uh, be using Duracell batteries. They, by the way, didn't want to do it, but they gave me like a free case of batteries. <laughs> but I still go out and tell the story. I still try to create value for who? For you guys. For the people that are listening to this, because I think you're better off, not that any of us use 9 volts and wireless anymore, they're all double A's now, but in those days when it was 9 volts, I really felt like I was doing a service to go out and help people. Just the same way I felt like I was doing a disservice to go out to pilots and tell them about Maui Gyms. It's not really about just about what can I do for dirt cells, what can I do for my audience to, to add value and to create value. So you make the appropriate contact in the um, uh, for the artist um, endorsement deals, artist relations is normally who you go to. They're the ones that will take your CD and your press kit and put it in a big pile of others and eventually, hopefully, get to it if you're persistent enough. That's a good way to go. I never go to artist relations. I mostly don't know a lot of the artist relationships. Artist relations people. I do know them, but I don't work with them. I work with their bosses usually, who are usually vice presidents of marketing and stuff. Because I go to them with a different kind of proposal. I go to them with a marketing proposal that's not about just getting free gear. It's really much broader than that. So what usually happens is I go directly to a marketing person, I talk to them about it, they kick me back down at first to the artist relations person and says, put it through. So it's kind of it's a unique proposition. It's it's creating a unique value. And um, if they say no, you know, then they say no. If they say yes, then it means expectations on both sides. Very rarely do I actually have a contract with any of these companies, but on occasion I do. But 
there's expectation on both sides. You expect something from them, they expect something from you. The most important part of that equation is that you deliver what they expect. That's what I focus on. That's what I think you should focus on, is what you can do for them. And it ultimately comes down to positioning your value. You've got to identify what your unique value is and then figure out how to position it. So when you're approaching a certain company, you've got to research their market. You need to know what you can provide to them. Like the Martin example, where I figured I could provide to them the younger audience that they're not currently reaching. That's the unique value that I pitch. Or Sennheiser Aviation is a really good example of saying, you know, I can bring your music credibility into the aviation market. Nobody else that you're working with is doing that. So that's the unique value. As I mentioned early in the presentation, I do accept no. I'm okay with somebody telling me no. No is the second best answer. I'm not a fan of maybes. Huge waste of time. Maybe is usually a delayed no. Um, I like no. I like no because I can also ask why. A no without a why is a missed opportunity. Anytime somebody says no to you, uh, I think it's very important to gracefully accept that. They say, but could you just tell me why? They're usually more than happy to tell you why. And then you can follow that up by saying, if I could solve that problem, can we revisit this? Almost all the time they say yes. And that's, you know, essentially how my relationship with Sennheiser started was, was addressing the problem of why they didn't think I was creating value, so I needed to create more value by not only being a customer, but by being able to speak about the products. So it's really uh, important to always ask the why. The marketing proposal is the key, ultimately. It's got to be one page. You've got to figure out how to be concise and, and explain your value, whether it's, as, whether it's for an endorsement deal or whether it's just to gain sponsorship for a single event or a series of events. One page marketing. Describes yourself. Describes what you need. And that's really important. You know, a lot of times I've, I talk to people and I say, well, what did you ask? You know, what are you asking for? And they say, I'll, I'll take whatever I can get. I hate that response. That, that response. <coughs> um, it used to be on uh, uh, example on Facebook. I was trying to think of it. I can't think of it at the moment. But figure out what you need. And only ask for what you need. And if it's a numbers thing, if you know it's going to cost you a certain amount of money to go do something, ask for what you need plus 10% just to cover anything. But don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Don't try and get whatever you can. Ask for what you need. In that proposal, you know you want to put all the facts and figures, the numbers about the event as well, really important, so that they know what you're asking them to invest in. Remember, you're not asking them to spend money on you, you're asking them to invest in you. Ultimately, you don't want to go through all of this for one deal. You want to develop a relationship with them where you can go back. And you can do that if you constantly create value for them. Tell them why you chose them. I told Sennheiser why I didn't like the Shore product and why I preferred the Sennheiser product. I told Martin why I like the Martin guitar over the guitar. I told Duracell why I like Duracell over Energy. Tell them why you're choosing them. I tell them to the point that says, to the point where I don't try and scare them and say, well, if you say no, I'm going to go to your competition. Usually what I say is if you say no, well, then I'm just going to have to go out and buy your product. I'm still going to talk about it. Most of the time, they really respond well to it and say, you know, that's the kind of people we want to be involved with, people that will buy our product over the competition and giving them free product. And then you got to tell them why they should do it, and that's, again, the math. There's nothing that pleases me more when I can do somebody else's homework and they all of a sudden perk up and realize they can take it to their boss and get the credit for it. It's great. I'm talking about that. And then, finally in that proposal, if you've got other sponsors in the past, you put them in there. You know, people are, people don't have to know, when I approach Volkswagen, they don't have to know that Yamaha gave me artist pricing, for example, on a, on a product. But I can tell them that Yamaha sponsors me even if it's just artist pricing, they don't even know that. All of a sudden that creates value. And so you can use your endorsement relationships, even if it's just artist pricing relationships, as long as it's legit, 
you can use it in a marketing proposal to show the recipient of that proposal that other people value you, that other companies value you, so they should too. So, I'm going to tell you about something because I think it's of great value. Ultimately, I'm trying to sell it to you. But I think it's a great value. Last year, I met a guy who runs a company called Artist Head. And he attended one of my lectures in LA. He said, you know, you've got so much content, so much information of everything that you've done in your life. You know, why don't you try and put it somewhere so that people can access it and use it? I never thought about it. So we created the Artist Career Development Center online, which is a membership-based platform that contains everything I use, every contract I've used, every marketing proposal I use. Um, a lot of my articles are in there. Um, Rob, who, who <coughs> is the artist head, he and I do a, um, like a monthly radio show going on next week. We put that in there on different aspects about the music business, uh, contract templates, Stuff about distribution, uh, lectures, samples of my lectures. There's so much stuff in there. Uh, articles on that I had, like electronic music position for endorsement deals, um, the sponsorship proposals, stuff on home studio business. I mean, it's just like everything I've tried to figure out for myself. I just put in there for other people to go in and you know maybe it's relevant to what you're trying to do now. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something that would be relevant to you later. Um, the artist head price for it's 99 bucks, and so basically what I do with these things is negotiate with them when I come out that we can do it for half price, and um, it's a 30-day money-back guarantee. I hate ending it on a pitch, but it's just such a cool thing because I'd rather you go in there, I'd rather you buy it, go in there, steal as much as you can, and ask for your money back than not do it at all because I think it'll help. I'd, obviously, I'd rather you stay in there and. Um, new content is added all the time, and it's not really an annual thing because we don't kick anybody out. It just gives us the right to kick people out. We haven't figured out how to do automatic renewal, so for now it's lifetime. But it's um, it's just a cool. I think it's a very cool thing, and so it's available to you guys. Uh, money back guarantee, of course, as I mentioned. If you think you can benefit from it, and I encourage you to go to buy it, try it, and by all means. Don't hesitate to ask for your money back if you don't think it's for you. But if it's for you, then it might really be helpful, and that would be my hope. And then finally, go for, you know, if you, if you want to try to win a, a mic uh, from Sennheiser, definitely go on the app. And go on the app anyway and just check it out, just to, just to see kind of what's going on in the mobile marketing, geofencing, and how these kinds of things can work for you. And, you know, sign up or not, but you got nothing to lose by signing up. And I think you'll find it, uh, I think you'll find it really interesting. It's amazing what's going on in this technology space. Just give you an example of geofencing. A perfect example would be, you guys all came here tonight to see me, right? So I'm drawing you to a place. Well, what if I put a geofence around this building today, and when you walked in, you got a message from your app saying that the poorhouse is offering 50% off drafts for the next two hours after, this, this isn't happening by the way, so don't go in there now, <laughs> but what if they did, and said, uh, um, you know, show this text and uh, get 50% off draft for two hours following Robbie's lecture. And you know that's a deal I would have pre-negotiated with them and I'd be getting a percentage of every draft you drink, so I'd encourage you to go drink. But that's the power of geofencing, especially for a touring entity, whether it's an artist, a speaker, whatever it is, I'm constantly drawing people to places. So why not do deals with the other businesses around that ultimately benefit you? Because you don't have to. You don't have to go get 50% off a pint next door. But you might want to. It'd be good for them because I'm driving business to them and then I get a commission. So these are the types of things that that's been going on in mobile marketing and geofencing is part of what I was talking about in China and Russia, where who are far more advanced on this whole stuff than we are in America, by the way, in mobile marketing. Well ahead of us. It's really interesting. You know, you look at places like India, they were using cell phones long before we were, because they didn't have a landline infrastructure. We always had landlines, so we didn't need cell phones. As soon as somebody put a satellite up, all of a sudden everybody in India could communicate. So they adopted cell phone technology 
for us, as they did in China. We're finding the same thing actually in aviation, where these economies are growing in these brick countries that I'm talking about, Russia, India, China, Brazil, and they can't build highways quickly enough to connect the cities. But they can build airstrips. And so now, that's a lot of what I talk about at the universe, aeronautical universities, the opportunities to go train pilots locally in these countries. So there's just a lot going on globally, a lot going on technologically. And really, it's all right there for you. You just have to go after it. And these companies are all interested in being part of that. They really are. In many cases, they don't know where to begin or how to approach any of these countries. I talk to these companies all the time about what we can do in these different parts of the world. They don't have the infrastructure, but you know what? They have me now. And I try to bring that to all of my relationships. You guys can do it. You guys can do it as well. It's really not that difficult. Some questions? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I got two, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it sounds like everything that you were able to like start off with was off of Hanson. But if, it, if that wasn't the case, how would you have gone about it to land, uh, you know, other sponsorships whenever you didn't have that, you know, uh, media or following that you had before then, you know, say, like, you know, you're just an artist on, mm -hmm. you know, like, digging at bars. No, it's, a, like it's, a, it's a very legitimate question. Um, actually, none of the business that I have actually stemmed from Hanson, but the story did. The story was part of it. As far as building that book, wouldn't that be related to Hanson? I mean, it, it was my story. Um, it was an interesting story that I was able to get published because of the caliber of the band. Mm -hmm. and, right. and it's an evolution. And the book you know, became the CD, which is an independent CD, which then went into speaking and then went into all of that. I, there's no doubt it was a catalyst for me. But I'll, I'll back it up just a little bit because I didn't tell you the story. A little bit of time. I didn't tell you the story about how I got the gig with Hanson. So you could you could back it up even further, which is that I did have one of the more advanced digital studios in the suburbs of New York City because I made that decision to not spend money in studios but to work hard, save it, and build that studio, which then attracted interesting people from New York, to, songwriters, to come out and do their demos in my studio. And one of those guys was a guy named Rob Mathis, who I think has been here a number of times and performed, very talented guy. He had become, an old friend of mine, he had become, uh, uh, he was a client of my studio, and then he became the musical director for Vanessa Williams. Needless to say, Rob wasn't recording in my mother's basement anymore at that time, and he had lost touch. But about two years later, I sent him a Christmas card, just to touch base. That was in December of uh, 1996. So in February of 1997, when he was in the offices of Mercury Records, and the an Nanar guy comes and says, hey, Rob, do you know some young guitar player uh, for a band that we're just trying to launch? It's just for one gig. Um, I was on his mind, because I just sent him a Christmas card. So he gave them my phone number. And he called me up and said, Ravi, I'm really sorry. I know we haven't talked in a while, but I just gave out your phone number. I should have called you first. I said, well, who did you give it to? He said, I gave it to an a and guy at Mercury Records. I've had worse days. <laughs> I said, this is a problem I can handle. Um, but I did something that, in retrospect, turned out to be very intelligent at, at the time. I didn't, I, it was just sort of a knee-jerk reaction. But I just said, well, since you gave out my number without asking me first, could you at least give me his number? So he gave me the number to the a &R guy at Mercury Records. The guy didn't call me. Two days went by, I figured, I got nothing to lose, I'm gonna call him. So I called him. He said, oh yeah, I've been meaning to call you. Um, yeah, we're kind of on a tight schedule. Can you send me a, a, a sample of your playing and a photo? And so I said, sure. Uh, where do you want me to send it? He said, well, I'm in a rush. It's a weekend, why don't you send it to my house? So he gave me his home address. I realized he lived 20 minutes away from me. So I said, well, you know what? I could bring it over tonight if you want. I was thinking, this is my opportunity to shake the hands of an A&R guy at a major way. She said, yeah, it'd be great. So I went over there, gave it to him, shook his hand. Two, three days later, he called me back, hired me for one gig in, in uh, Orlando, which was a, a convention to launch the band. After that, I went back to my teaching and my studio for a month. The second call I get is, what do you, from, from him, is what are you doing on May 6th? I said, I don't know, what's going on May 6th? 
He said, would you be free to play the David Letterman show? He was like, I could probably work this into my schedule. And we did Letterman, Rosie O'Donnell, all of that. And then the band just took off. It was a big point of the story being that that opportunity, the Hanson opportunity, while, while without a doubt moved my career to the next level, is part of a proactive business philosophy that continuously grows and grows and grows. So, I, I, the, the, I guess the point is, is that that lucky break is the moment when preparation meets, meets opportunity. So it's hard to say that this all happened because of Hanson, because Hanson happened because of something else. So would you say you purposely sent that letter just to, you know, in hopes that something would happen? Or because no, I mean, then again, that also kind of sounds, you know, like what a lucky break, you know, when you're just, you know, meeting new people and reporting. You know, no, it's just by nature. Like I, the nature is keep in touch with people that are doing well. I didn't just send Rob a Christmas card. I probably sent out a hundred, including, you know, to students and to to, to clients, and anybody that was coming to my studio. Okay. My next question is that whenever you do contact uh, different companies, you just go straight to artists. Uh, artist uh, relations or that you Right, well, that's what I was saying. The artist relations is typically who one goes to. I always try to go right above them and with something that's more interesting than just an artist relations pitch and try to go, try to try to approach them with a one-page marketing proposal that addresses what I see as a void in their current marketing approach. But I would never say it's a void because that makes somebody look bad. I would just say, hey, you know, this is an opportunity if you considered it. And usually that triggers the VP of marketing to say, that was very interesting, let's stay in touch. Meanwhile, um, I want to put you in touch with an artist relations person. And then I've come to artist relations not as a cold call, but internally from, from a higher level. So you go to marketing first and then I did, but don't go to marketing unless you've got something right. really interesting and unique, unique value to the position. Right. Yeah, I actually have the same question too, but like, how do you like literally just find the number? Are you just going to the website and being like, who do I call? Do I call the vice president? Do you like look up who that is and try to find his? Yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of that. Just go to exactly. Just go to, uh, you know, Google is my best friend. Except for when I was in China. You realize you can't get Google in China? <laughs> Gmail went down, everything went down. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have one question about uh, about time management. That with all these ideas, with all these things that that doesn't exist, that actually you have to make it happen. How you manage your agenda? Like your like every day. That's for me so important right now. Like to understand that with with when, like someone with you, like your talent mm -hmm. of creating possible things. Yeah, it's, time management is a real is really hard, especially when you're traveling as much as, as I am. You know, people often ask me, you know, if I fly myself to my gigs, and I don't, because that's valuable time for me, sitting in the back of the plane or in the train, to do a lot of this stuff. So I try to use my um, travel time extremely efficiently. Okay. I'm up pretty early. You know, I'm, I'm up 7, 8 in the morning. Um, I'm up pretty late, about 1, 2 in the morning. Um, I try to use my time as efficiently as I possibly can. <coughs> But that being said, I still, when I'm, when I'm home, I still cook dinner with my wife and watch a movie every night. Nice. So, every night. And uh, we're, we're good Netflix guys. But, <laughs> but, I mean, that's important. That's really important part of it. But it, I'm efficient. I work efficiently. And I, I, sh I really try to work as efficiently. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Dylan. I just wanted to ask you uh, two questions. One was about early in the presentation, you talked about your article writing about the guitars, and you made the joke about, like, I don't want to buy my guitar from Walmart. That's ridiculous. And kind of what I wanted to ask you is, did you make that statement, and did you continue on that path to write that article about that stuff as a result of, like, wanting to adhere to a value of integrity? Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of a joke, but at the same time, I feel the same way. I don't want to buy a microphone or a guitar from that type of vendor, and like, how has that adherence to integrity affected your career? Um, I, 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 I think that a commitment to integrity is only enhanced by career. Okay. Um, you know, the, look, to, to this day, whenever I'm in Connecticut, as I will be 
Thursday and Friday. I go to Connecticut Music, where that guitar was born. The same three brothers and dad. Dad died last year. Work in that store. And I'll be there for two hours. And for the last 15 years, I haven't dropped a dime in that store. I don't, there's nothing I need to buy, since all my stuff is provided. But we go and we hang out. And every article that I've ever written about the um, devaluation of the way musical instruments are sold starts, in my mind, in that store. And most small to medium-sized manufacturers understand the value of the independent dealer. Even Fender does. Gibson's gone in a completely different direction. They said, we don't, we don't understand the value of any dealer. And we want to sell direct. It's actually very smart. Right? But it's, it's moving in a, you know, in, a different, in a different direction. So <coughs> the important question is integrity. I have a brand identity statement, if you will. That I, that's my litmus test in everything that I do, from every talk or every uh, lecture I give. And it's simply reaching audiences with a voice of integrity. Anybody know what the acronym for that is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. And it's every time something comes to me, or an offer comes to me, is can I reach the audience and maintain my integrity. Can I write this article with a voice and integrity? Okay, and, and my second question actually kind of had to do with his question as a part of like being a developing, like up and coming, all of us are up and coming musicians or hopefully, um, and this idea of like not just sort of on the way up, you could say, but if, let's say, uh, you talked about that festival in New Orleans and, and this, this company, their, your sponsorship or your relationship with them is pays your mortgage, like what, what would what would your opinion be? Let's say if in in theory, like a major sponsor of yours, like uh, who enables you to live the way that you do, hindered your ability to involve in your involvement um, in a major part in like India. Like why would it hinder? I mean, if they like withdrew, if you weren't able to get any more, like. They weren't able to fly you places. You mean if they just canceled their yeah. commitment with me? Yeah. Let, let's say a relationship you've had for well, like sign eyes and sign mm -hmm. So, but what's the question? What would happen? Like, what, what would, would I do? do? What would you do? Curl up in a ball and cry. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a reasonable one. <laughs> um, It depends why. If if it were simply a, a budgetary matter, I would wait it out a year or two and see if the fiscal situation changes. If it's because they're getting out of a segment of the industry right. that I'm in, let's say Sennheiser left aviation, and so obviously they're no longer going to going to support me in aviation. They're no longer in the industry. Then I'd go to their their competitor, who would no longer be a competitor because they're not in there anymore, so it wouldn't be a conflict of interest. As long as, as long as I felt that the product was still the best product out there for the pilot. Okay. I can't I was, promote a product. Okay, yes. I was saying the like, worst case scenario, and then and let's say you hate, what was it, you hate uh, energizer batteries, mm -hmm. and not that uh, Duracell would ever collapse, but like if Duracell collapsed. Would I go to the, right. would I go to the enemy? And your life, and, and your passion, like, because you talked about integrity, your, um, this other outlet, this philanthropy and stuff like like I would leave the battery business. Okay. Um, cool. Because there are enough other product categories to go to. That's the thing, you know, you, you this lecture is kind of about how to sell out without selling out. You, you just don't have to sell out. Because there are enough products and enough product categories that we all use that we all love. Yeah. Uh, you said that you got, you know, your artist relationships with in your studio. How did you build that word of mouth about your studio in your parents' basement being the best one, you know? Uh, 
other than having uh, big name artists and then go and have them go spread word about. Well, I had no big name artists at the time. Everybody was just local. Um, but it mostly had to do with the fact that I had a band and I was playing local. So we were in a circle. We talked to other bands. And we talked to other people. Yes. And you know that that was it. The other side of that too was I had students. Students were writing songs, wanted to record. Um, so you know that was part of my client too. Cool. I actually found a really other weird niche. I don't know how I did it, but I used to I used to edit music. And it was like splicing tape edit in those days for like teenage girls skating competitions. But whatever it was, you know, and then and then one skater would say, Oh, well, you gotta have Robbie do your music for the next competition because he did a good job. And that's always what it comes down to. He's doing a good job. Yeah. Okay. Um, for going to the music, um, where is a great place to start? You create the music, you record the album and stuff like that, but you're having trouble with the media. How, like, how do you build followers? How do you build fans? How do you get to play with the big bands and all that? And so what would you be advised to start out with once you create your first album and it's really good? How do you know it's really good? Um, the melodies are nice and all that, and you know the sound is great, and people like it, and then you know just that's, but the that's the key. People like it because we all like it, um, and your mom likes it, and you know. But what? But that isn't your, it's 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 other people right. that like it. So right. you know reviews obviously are important if you can get a review. The quotes are really important. I, I, I'm constantly, from everything I do, you know, Elise will be asked to provide a quote on my presentation tonight. And depending on what she says will determine whether or not I use it. But I'm going to ask for it. I acquire feedback constantly from every source that I possibly can. Whether it's people that have listened to my music, whether it's people that have read an article, or whether it's people that have hired me to do a lecture or something like that. Always acquiring objective third-party feedback. And that's the best way to then show media and other people. And, and there's no magic bullet for any of this. It's, and that's the thing. All of you, like me, all, are kind of, I hope there's a quick answer. There really isn't. It just comes down to work. And it's good work. Because it's your career. You're working for yourself. Um, what is your like threshold for stepping outside of like your comfort zone? Ah, because like question. Because you said that you've never written for anything before, and you just took that job, and you're doing these speaking jobs. I don't know if you had public speaking, you know. Like, no. What What got you to really push it? Like, uh, my my favorite. I kind of I remember the time when it happened. I was on a. Um, it was in the early 90s, and I was on a train, my first trip overseas by myself. And I, I was, my luggage was lost by the airline, and, um, and I couldn't read the, it was in French, and I couldn't read the, the cost of the right ticket. And I was actually trying to buy a ticket to go visit a friend in Italy, and nobody would help me. And I just started punching buttons and putting money until I got something. And then I got on the train. And I had to change train in Switzerland. And when I changed in Switzerland, the, the, I got onto the Italian train. And the Italian, I don't speak Italian, conductor was hassling me. And I think trying to throw me off the train because I didn't have the right. To, and it, I just, I, I was scared, really unsure. I couldn't communicate with anybody. These days, it was pre-Euro. Um, so I didn't have any, any um, francs. French francs, and I didn't have any Italian lira, and I didn't have any right money, and this guy wanted money. And I just remember, once that whole scene was over, sitting there looking out the window saying, this is like the coolest day of my life. I just got through it. And ever since then, I mean, I've had moments like that in like the slums of Bombay, where like, I shouldn't be here. This is a really bad scene. I got out of it. Damn, that was cool. 
<laughs> I had moments like that in China last week, or in Russia at the Kremlin. So funny, my, my cell phone at the Kremlin all of a sudden just like all of a sudden went out, blew up. It's like that's weird. What was I filming that shouldn't be filmed? Yeah. But this is cool. You know, I'm incapa anytime I feel a little incapacitated and I get through it, I feel like a million bucks. And I have uh, from so many of those experiences. I have a lot of self-confidence that I'll get through those situations. So the really interesting question was the threshold of, of my comfort zone. Um, I feel that the most comfortable place for me is right outside on the border of my comfort zone. Something that I just haven't done before, but I'm not too far, but just slightly expanding that comfort zone and trying something new. You know, like, I mean, I had never done this lecture I gave in China and in Russia. I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, I glance up there, you know, for just to keep me on. Everything was in a foreign language. I had no clue what my PowerPoints were saying. Um, I couldn't read. And then I have people that are translating for me in real time. And we have talked about being in a, in a really strange situation, but it was awesome. And I grew a lot from it. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of stepping out of your company. One last question? Anybody? Yeah. Could you play something for us since you're on the music school? Play something for you. That wasn't the question I was ready for. <laughs> if someone's got a guitar or something. Somebody have a guitar? It's a tailor, though. It's a tailor. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't play that. <laughs> It's a non-exclusive. Uh, my kids can't endorse the talent, but I can play. Oh, wait, you guys, just quickly, if you could just fill out those forms, it really helps us in terms of what we present next. So the silly little golf pencils we gave, you just use them. We really appreciate it. It'll take one minute. <laughs> All is not lying. We've got a lot of track. <laughs> You guys know Will Lee, bass player? Really famous? Yeah. yeah.
partido más son...